Welcome everybody to the video that I think is just going to be known as the video where Jason talks about why Cracked fired everybody back in 2017 and, and how the brand that had been built up to uh, something truly special went uh, in the, the toilet. Um, two things you should know right away. One, the people who own Crack now are not the people who fired everyone in 2017. The site was actually sold again just uh, like six months ago. It was in the fall of 2019. So unless the person you're upset about was fired since then, then you don't have any reason to be mad about the site. No one involved in the decision to let everyone go in 2017, no one who made the decision to let go of Dan O'Brien and Cody Johnston and, and everyone else, there no one still remains at Cracked. The company that made that decision will not profit from your visit to Cracked, as, as far as I know. Um, so if you have been like holding that against the site or boycotting the site for that reason, you can, it, it it's a whole new thing now. Um, they're still turning out uh, smart content and the cracked voice that you know and love. They're trying to get video going again. Um, but the people who own it now are kind of trying to get it back into a shape of something that can last and be, and be great again. Um, this video is actually the first Q&A video. Uh, we solicited a bunch of questions from fans on social media, got something like uh, the 200 questions, I think, obviously are not going to answer all of those. That would be madness. That what we're going to do is multiple videos like this, um, that broken up by subject matter. And welcome to the one about Cracked. And what do you know, most of the questions were about, well, why are all of the people I loved from Cracked uh, gone? And why did you not update your YouTube channel for like two and a half years or however long it was? Those are all good questions. Uh, it's the elephant in the room, I guess. So yeah, this will effectively be me telling my version of the story about why in 2017 the site uh, went into the toilet. Um, so in some ways I, I realize maybe it's not productive to rehash the past, but at the same time I've never talked publicly about exactly what happened. I now no longer work there. I willingly left uh, just last month. Um, on good terms, I'm still coming back and doing stuff for the site. Uh, it was a long decision that I, you know, we went through and carefully handed off my tasks and all that. It was just time for me to go. I'd been there for 12 and a half years. I survived those layoffs and tried to keep things intact for a while after that, but it had taken such a toll on me that I moved on. Um, uh, and also, that said, if you're only tuning in because you expect me to breathe fire on like specific people from scripts or people who are involved in the decision or to name names or yell at them, I, I'm not going to do that. Uh, if you're an attorney for scripts and you're watching this for signs that I'm going to, uh, to defame people at the company, I have nothing like that to say. You know, whatever executive made that decision it was there they have a boss and then the boss answers to the shareholders and um, I'm sure if they were here they would say look we all were just doing what we were forced to do um, so the first question it was from uh, someone wanted to be called Grand Lunar or maybe that's their actual name I don't know but uh, asked, will you ever be on the Crack Podcast again? Yes, and in fact, I'm on this week's episode, this week meaning the week that I'm shooting this um, with the wonderful host, Alex Schmidt, uh, one of the best people in the business, in any business. Um, but the episode that went up on Monday, April the 27th, I was on, uh, so that was after I left the company. 
Yes, I came back and did the podcast just as I said I would in case anyone thought I was just posturing. Um, The subject of the episode, of course, at the time this is being recorded, the pandemic, uh, the coronavirus is is what's on everyone's mind. So we kind of did a debate where uh, he was like, I think the virus is bad. And then I took the position like, no, people... People should die. We should, everyone should die. That's not true. We talked about other things. Um, next question from uh, this person who has a very difficult foreign to me name. Uh, I was going to spend like half an hour practicing this name because I've got a pronunciation here and really impressed them um, with how well I learned the pronunciation. And then I just, I just didn't do it. Uh, I would love to say that it's because I, I didn't have time to do that, um, but that's also not true. It, it's a it's a pandemic lockdown. I had all day, but I just didn't. I'm sorry. But uh, P. Period Jones says, "What's the biggest what could have been or missed opportunity you witnessed as the cracked editor in chief?" I was not the editor in chief. That was Jack O'Brien. I was the executive editor. But that's. I, I understand why not everyone knows that because executive editor is just a made-up job title we came up with on a call one day. Um, but what's the biggest missed opportunity, like a talent you couldn't sign on or a project that didn't take off or whatever? Um, this one's easy to answer. I did not plan for Trump winning the 2016 election. Um, but I will admit, I thought... You know, because we had done a ton of good work leading up to the uh, to the election, and in fact, that's why we actually did spectacular traffic that fall, which is that's foreshadowing for those of you who know what's about to happen later in the story. Um, but it was about kind of not just Trump bad articles, but digging into kind of the cultural things that were going on in America, kind of. Um, you know, all the factors that led to his rise and kind of digging into the history of it and and all that stuff. And it did very, very well with it. But I thought that as of November 9th or whatever election day was, that that would be over. Because, and I used to joke about this on calls, that, you know, the Trump carnival is going to come to an end on November 9th. He's going to go off and start his YouTube channel or whatever he intended to do with his life. Um, and then Hillary would be president with the Republican Congress, which meant that not only is she the most boring possible option for president, but that nothing would get passed. It would just, you know, politics would just be a series of these hearings of Republicans trying to impeach her over her emails or Benghazi or whatever the other stuff was. Um, Pizzagate, there'd be a Pizzagate hearing at some point, I don't doubt but that it would be very tedious and that we would move on, you know, because we had been through a solid year and a half. From late 2015 on, it had been the Trump show. And I say it, I'm talking about the culture. It had just been Trump, Trump, Trump. And so I was planning for like the post-Trump era. Like, okay, it's going to be more like the, you know, the Obama years in the early Obama years where people were more into wanting to read about uh, pop culture and, and trivia and stuff like that, um, because that's where Cracked was born. Remember, you know, I came on Cracked uh, 2007. You know, Obama elected right after that, and there was like this this era of sort of good feelings among at least our demographic, and people like you know, wanting to kind of just read the trivia or read about Batman or or whatever, um, and we kind of thrived in that environment and I kind of thought it'd be that again if I were really good at my job I would have had a plan in place for well what if he wins because you know in retrospect it wasn't that weird that he won he was only down by a few points in the polls and then you had some people out there like Nate Silver saying hey if you look at the electoral college in some of these states that are going to decide the election we don't actually have polling we don't know who's up in Michigan. We, we don't know who's up in Arizona and Nevada. So um, if I was good at my job, I would have, we, there would have been multiple meetings and calls because, see, I could set up those meetings saying, hey, let's talk about what the site will look like. If Trump wins, what are people going to want to talk about or think about? 
you know, and, and now we know they just wanted the daily Trump outrage every single day. What's the, the dumb thing he said today? But I feel like you could have had a strategy of saying, okay, well, let's assume that people can get that elsewhere. So what can cracked be in that environment? What can we be? What's the different thing we can offer and have like a, a solid strategy in place for, okay, here's our niche now that we're in the Trump era. A lot of people are scared. There's high levels of anxiety. Maybe people don't want to read about Batman trivia so much anymore, but what can we be with this tremendous crew of people we've assembled, this great video talent? Like what kind of shows will thrive in that in that era, in that environment? And it, it's instead we were or at least I was caught completely flat-footed, and we kind of had to throw together a strategy completely on the fly. And what it would turn out, and we'll talk about this a little bit more later, was that all of the, like the platforms and the social media platforms that fed us all of our traffic, they became extremely biased toward current events and current up-to-the-minute news because, of course, in this environment, people are this afraid, people are this anxious, all they want to know is like, what has happened today? And that had never been cracked. You know, our whole thing was we wrote these evergreen articles about history and science and, and pop culture, but it was stuff that made sense whether you read it today or 10 years from now, it would read as the same article because it's looking back at history or the history of comic books or, or something like that. And trivia doesn't change. And all of the algorithms and all of the, the search stuff and all that that feeds a website its traffic all became just news, 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 Trump, Trump, Trump. And it kind of choked everything else out. Maybe if I had had a better strategy, um, it, maybe we could have survived that better. Um, but I don't know because uh, other sites, you know, you look at like the Tonight Show with Jimmy Fallon who saw his ratings fall through the floor because he was not political and suddenly, you know, this is a new environment where if you take a political stand, you automatically lose half of your audience, one half or the other. If you take no stand, you lose all of your audience <laughs> because that somehow is the worst way to approach it. And if you try to do both and it's like, well, today we'll be Republicans and tomorrow we'll be uh, progressive or whatever, uh, that's the worst of all because people just see it as, well, you don't stand for anything. Okay, so this takes us right into the questions about uh, the events of December 2017 when everything kind of went went to hell. Uh, I realize some of you listening to this, um, I may have mentioned it earlier, or, or maybe not. That was, a, that was a whopping 17 minutes ago. I can't remember what was happening that long ago. Uh, but I realize some of you don't know what I'm talking about with the layoffs or the infamous layoffs. I mean, I don't, at the websites I follow, I don't like obsessively keep track of what was going on behind the scenes. Um, but like some of the questions that came in, like Steve asked, he said, I miss After Hours. That was an extremely popular show we had on our YouTube channel. And I'd like to hear your thoughts on, you know, was there any warning about what happened? Um, Nick asked, is there a scenario where crack doesn't meet the abrupt, you know, change that, that occurred, all that. So all of these questions, I'm just going to basically, instead of answering them one by one, I'll just tell the story from the beginning as best as I can recollect it. Um... I've got I have my notes here. This could take like an hour to get through, but uh, what else do we have to do, right? So um, I was hired at Cracked in 2007, as I may have mentioned already. Um, this The Cracked, the old paper magazine that had been around since 1958, it had gone out of business in 2006, and there had been multiple attempts to kind of resurrect it that finally just, it, it all fell apart. All the staff, everybody was let go, they closed down the office. And then basically all that remained was a domain name, crack.com, and they had, you know, like all magazines, they had an online component. It was being run by the great Jack O'Brien, um, the guy who was as responsible for the subsequent success of Cracked as anybody on earth the best in the business at what he did, the best in the business at what he does now. He's moved on 
uh, he's not dead. He's he, he has a podcast now. Um, but basically, it was Jack and one other guy, and they were refugees from one of the attempts to resurrect the magazine, and they were left to just run the website as like the most bare bones operation. It was two guys working from home, like there's just two guys in their apartments. That was it. That was cranked at the time. I don't know what the traffic was at the time. It was growing because, again, Jack is great at what he does. Um, the other guy he was working with was a guy named Jay Pinkerton, who is also fascinating. He left in 2007 to go work at Valve, the video game company. He actually wrote or co-wrote the game Portal 2, um, which is a very funny game. And then he recently, I believe, worked on that Half-Life game they just came out with, the, the VR game. Um, the Jay left... And so they, that being half the staff, they let Jack hire someone, and that someone was me. I was working at an insurance company at the time, uh, just doing data entry on, on insurance claims. I was making like $9 an hour, uh, working in a cubicle. Uh, I, don't, I don't want to make that job sound like it was a nightmare, because I know that some of you would kill to have that job. I'm just saying he didn't hire me as like a famous writer or comedian. I was a guy working at an insurance company who had a website he ran as a hobby, and I had a book that I had just sold the film rights on, um, but it was not a movie yet. I had just So things were starting to happen for me, but the point is Jack hired me on to help him run Cracked, this, this website, and now it was two guys working from home in their bedrooms, and from there, over the next nine years, we would grow Cracked to be hundreds and hundreds of times the size that it was until in, I think, April of 2016, it sold to EW Scripts for nearly $40 million, $38.5 million, I think. So this was a site that this company had bought the domain name from the old magazine to to basically uh, run it as a website for, I think they paid almost nothing. And in the nine years since then, we built it up to this thing that sold for nearly 40 million bucks. At that point, I think we had 43 full-time employees. We had a YouTube channel with 2 million subscribers. We had, I think, five different podcasts on our own podcast network, basically. Um, we had two books that had sold very, very well. We did live shows that sold out that were standing room only. We did uh, videos with celebrities. We uh, did, were doing meetings about doing TV shows. Uh, Dan O'Brien was doing guest appearances on the History Channel. So we had built it up to basically the apex of its value was in the spring of 2016. And the company that had owned it before sold it to EW Scripps. Then it would be a little more than a year later. It would be in August of 2017 that I think, and the dates are fuzzy, but it would be in August of 2017, I believe, uh, when they would announce they were taking a write down on the entire purchase price of crack. Basically them saying it didn't work. Uh, in December of 2017, they announced they were closing the office uh, letting go of 80 to 85 percent of the staff, shutting down video production. They fired the social media team, the podcast producer, uh, sh shut off, like cut off most of the contractor budget, just basically just turned, just gutted the entire operation. Um, that me and Jack and then everyone else had slowly put together one person at a time, one reader at a time, we've been building up for a decade. And just a year and a half after they paid 40 million bucks for the brand, they cut it loose. So when talking about why that happened, there's two kind of parts to the answer. One is that the digital publishing industry in general collapsed. Uh, ad rates fell through the floor. The reasons for it are very technical and in many ways very boring. I'm going to save those for later in the video um, because they always tell you in, you know, in the world of entertainment, you want to save the boring part for last. 
Um, you want to leave. You want to leave readers. You don't want to have people too worked up when they like walk out of the theater. You want to kind of ease them into it. It's like now, you know, you you want them to walk out saying, "I'm glad to get back to my everyday life because this thing I watched started to bore me so much that um, I'm now eager to to for it to be over." That was the the Game of Thrones theory behind their final season. Um, but then the other part of the answer is what specifically uh, happened with Cracked and scripts that maybe could have gone differently in response to what was happening with the industry. Because in terms of the industry, I, I don't know if you follow digital publishing or, or just as a fan of these websites, College Humor laid off its entire staff. Funny or Die laid off its entire staff. Uh, the Onion has been sold, I think, twice at least and have, have been through multiple rounds of layoffs. Um, the Onion sister site, the excellent Clickhole, it was sold to yet a different company, I believe, from what owns The Onion. Um, and e again, each time they get sold, there, there's more and more people are let go. It, it, there are more writers and editors and creative people on the street now than at any time ever. Um, so when I talk about what happened at Scripps, it's, you have to understand that there's a context of what we're really saying was, could they have, uh, reacted differently? Could they have tried harder to save the site? Because from our point of view, our being the people who were not in on that decision, but either were let go or our friends were let go or have, were, were forced to kind of try to deal with the fact that, that we were trying to run the website with the fraction of the staff we had before, it, it didn't make sense that they paid so much for it and gave up on it so fast. Because you would think with that kind of an investment, you would be thinking in terms of, okay, we have, we have bought a bunch of very, very talented people who have a track record for producing great content the market for making money off the content is is in the toilet right now, but we still have this engine for creating the content. We still have this process. We still have this collection of extraordinarily talented people. So let's figure out what we can do with it. And, and from our point of view, that didn't happen. Um, again, if there were executives from Script here, uh, they may explain that they did try very hard, or that or that they didn't, or or that they didn't have a choice. But again, if they want to say that, they can shoot their own video. I'm worried that right now, as I start to tell the story, you're going to be expecting a sexier story than what than what actually occurred, because your impression of of this kind of thing is from pop culture, like the show Succession on HBO. If you're not watching that show, you should. But it's about uh, like this this family that owns a, a, a media conglomerate, and there's like the old man, the gruff Logan Roy, and his son Kendall Roy, and Roman, and and they're all schemers and backstabbing. And the show is all about all of the subterfuge and strategy and under the table dealing that goes on. As you know, in in the in the show, they actually buy a website at one point and they gut it because the old man doesn't understand that and. And he does it behind his son's back, and and it's kind of, um, it's all very it's all very exciting and dramatic, and and a lot of people like yelling at each other. And I do understand where if you were like following social media or whatever around December twenty seventeen, when suddenly everybody was let go, and you know the, the the office closed and all that, I can see looking at that and saying, you know what, I bet the drama and subterfuge behind that decision was just sexy as hell. Uh, like when you think about like Dan O'Brien and Cody Johnston, and it's like, it's like these guys had to have had, like there had to have been scheming and factions and every other thing. If that was going on, uh, I wasn't included on those emails. Um, but remember I worked at home I worked here where I'm at now. Um, and, and so I wasn't at the office. The office was actually in L.A. That's where all the people you know from the site worked. The parent company is actually in Cincinnati. They were in yet a different location. So uh, whatever sexy scheming that went on, I could sit here and speculate about it um, or or maybe write uh, like like erotic fiction about it, but it wouldn't be it wouldn't be helpful.
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell the story. Now, you don't, you don't have to stop watching because I do think what happened is interesting in terms of what happened with the industry. And I think it affects you because it, it touches on how information travels and how media works in, in 2020. Uh, it's really interesting. It's very emotional subject for me because obviously it upended the lives of all of my friends and colleagues and a lot of talented people. It's just not very sexy is all. That's all. If you're expecting a sexy video, um, you're going to be somewhat disappointed. It depends on what you get turned on by. Um, and I do, I do take off my shirt later because it's, it's warm in here. Um, one thing to note, just, I actually mentioned this earlier. I never owned the cracked or, or was the guy running it. There was a thing, if you ever go on Google and you type a celebrity name, it, one of the things that it auto completes to is net worth because there's these like these fake celebrity net worth sites out there that for some reason, and there's this period of time after the script sale when you could type in David Wong net worth and it would come up $38 million because I guess people or, or the, the bots that programmed those sites thought that I owned Cracked and had sold it for, you know, that much money. I never owned it. I was always just an employee, you know, I was an editor who had been hired to work there drawing a salary like anybody else. Um, and so I rolled up to Jack O'Brien. He was the editor-in-chief. And basically the way it worked was he kind of had to deal with he, you know, he, he had some oversight over the creative end, but also had to deal mostly with the business side and, and all the stuff with the, the revenue and sponsorships and budget, all that stuff that he very graciously spared me from and like didn't make me go to those meetings so that I could focus on writing articles, editing articles, deciding like the, the you know, the editorial direction of the site, that kind of thing. But I, I've always reported up to somebody else at some level. So uh, if we, let's rewind to spring of 2016 when Scripps bought the site. Um, Scripps, you know, this was not uh, like a group of corporate raiders who were trying to buy the site so that they could uh, like launder the money for their, their tiger breeding operation. It wasn't anything like that. Scripps is a, this 150 year old, this proud journalism brand um, that, you know, that, that means something. As hard as it is to keep a company running for 150 weeks, if you've been doing it for 150 years, there's something right about your corporate culture, about your leadership. Like, there's something that you're doing that works. And Scripps owned, at one time or another, newspapers, radio stations, cable channels. And they've spun the stuff off into different companies over time. But my point is that they have deep, deep roots in journalism, broadcast journalism, and they take it very, very seriously. It's not some fly-by-night operation. It's not some get-rich-quick thing. This is a publicly traded company um, with a deep corporate culture. We're being bought by a company that they came in like, look, we want to take what you're doing and really make it as big as it should be. And these are not empty promises because these are people who have deep roots in like cable TV. So, you know, we had this great video production arm and all of this great on-camera talent we had developed and all these processes and all this, this writing crews, all of this talent, you know, that we had put together. These were the people that could get that stuff on television, you know, or, or we, th we figured, um, or I figured. These are the people that have contacts with, with sponsors that do, you know, TV and, and cable TV and that kind of thing. Uh, they own podcast platforms. They own, a, you know, a Stitcher and that. So it's like they can take what we're doing on the podcast side and really blow it out and, and really make it bigger. And because that's where we were told the real money was, you know, on video, that's where the real money was. And so it's like, you know, finally we can be what what we wanted, which is instead of just being a website, it's like we want to be a lasting brand that will be around for another 50 years. That was the goal. You know, it's why we, we worked our butts off getting the books out there and trying to always, you know, to branch out because you didn't just want to be a website. We knew 
that you know no one has clicked on a banner ad since 1996 you know just having text on a web page is not a great business to be in but that's why you work so hard to cultivate all of this other talent and to try to be able to do these other things so you can make a show that looks like a sitcom or that looks like a you know a, a sci-fi drama or whatever you can prove that we've got you know the technological you know the equipment and the know-how and all of that to to do whatever you need us to do. We can make a, an entertainment and educational product that's smart, is for an educated audience, um, is for, you know, for the type of audience that, in theory, you want. You know, it, it's people that are engaged and that they're, they're there to uh, learn and, and are loyal to what you make because it's high quality, you know. Um, it seemed like a good. It seemed like a good fit. They at the time, you, you know, when I describe what they're doing, I keep emphasizing how old of a company it was. Well, a lot of what they're involved in is sort of what you would think of as old media. Things like I mentioned radio and, and local TV and TV news, things like that, and newspapers. So they, being a smart company, were you know very aggressively trying to expand into what you think of as new media stuff i had mentioned they had bought a podcast platform um clearly wanted to get into internet video you know they had paid what they paid for crack for a reason they wanted to get into what the kids were into these days cracked appealed to this millennial audience we had this tone where we're addressing like world events and important things but just being done in like um a language that the people that age speak and you know, what it was like there's cursing and adult language and, and it's very crude and irreverent but that's the way you know if you watch the daily show if you watch this last week tonight with john oliver that's the tone of that demographic right so they knew what they were buying or at least we thought they did and it's it, it, it's for an audience that is younger and more you know kind of tech savvy than what they traditionally deal with and so they were buying crack to try to buy themselves into a marketplace. And that's very common. You know, like when Facebook decided they wanted to get into virtual reality, they didn't reinvent the wheel. They went out and just bought Oculus. They bought a company that already did it. When Microsoft decided to make a game console, they went and bought game studios. You know, they bought Rare. They, they bought these studios to go just make games for them. But... Some of the examples you've just heard me mention, that can go wrong sometimes because a company can't just buy a smaller company like that that makes the thing they want to make and say, okay, just keep doing what you're doing, only you're doing it for us now. It really doesn't work like that. Um, because when you own that company, now you are in charge of the hiring, their budget, you know, a lot of the direction of the company and you have to have a really deep awareness of what that company does, what works, what doesn't work, kind of the lessons they've learned. And I got the sense, just from my my locate my remote location in my home, I got the sense that from the very very beginning, Scripps didn't fully understand what we were or what we did, or why we did it the way we did it. And even from those first few weeks of owning the site, I, I felt like they didn't know how to monetize it. Um, and a lot of that, it's as simple as, uh, you know, like a company, you have ad sales teams. And I think that, you know, there's people who have experience selling ads for local TV, things like that. But trying to hook up like a sponsorship deal for a YouTube series, that's a completely different thing. And if you're someone who's never sold that type of thing before, um, I just think that there's a learning curve. And maybe they weren't ready for it. Maybe that's unfair. But it felt like, to me, this is just my opinion, it felt like old media company buying new media company and not knowing what to do with it because they're in their their the institutional knowledge of that company is based around old media um and if you wanted to see like a fictional representation of that 
Um, one is there's a show on HBO called Succession where this exact thing happens, where Logan Roy uh, owns like TV stations and news channels and things like that. It is very like old media and, and that. And his son, Kendall, is more like new media and wants to get into and he like buys a website but they wind up gutting the website and shutting it down because the old man is like, well, it's not making money like the like the TV news does, like our like our movies do, and, and the, the son can't explain to him that that the monetization piece is something that has to come along, but that everyone's kind of learning those lessons of how to do it. Um, but and so it's and it was very it was a very sexy process, uh, at least from the show, but maybe not so much uh, in in real life. So, moving on with just the history of the thing, I think Crack's all-time high in terms of total audience reached was probably November of 2016. If you add up the audience on the website and on the YouTube channel and on the various podcast shows, November of 2016, Obviously, that's election month, um, but all of the content we had in the run-up to the election, the stuff we did right after that we slapped together quickly, uh, did very, very well. And I think that month is probably is probably the month when the Cracked as a brand reached the most people it has ever reached and maybe ever will. Um, I don't know. But probably a total audience, I would bet... It was probably in the neighborhood of something like 25 million people, individual human beings we reached that month across the various things we had going on with the site and the videos and the podcast. Um, and then there's millions more that only came to our Facebook page and saw our posts there but maybe didn't click through the site. So, so the total number of people who interacted with the brand uh, was however many it, it, it was, 25 million, 30 million, I don't know. But that month um, was probably our all-time high in terms of audience, and you may you've done the math. That was just one year before they shut everything down, so that's how quickly things kind of fell apart. Um, Jack O'Brien moved on to a better job, and I think it was spring of 2017, and left because at the time, you know, this is just a few months after. You know, we had this this monstrous end of the year to 2016, and then it's just a few months later that he went off and got hired away by the company that's now iHeartRadio or or whatever they've called it. It's the biggest podcast brand out there to do a show called The Daily Zeitgeist. Um, and the Zeitgeist is that's just the German word for podcast. It literally means literally translated as means microphone ghost. Um, but it was, he left, I think, in March, April, something like that. So now we're just like eight months out from the from the, the, everything going dark. And he leaves in a position where it's like, yeah, things are going, I'm leaving it in good hands. Um, you know, uh, a lot of, you know, my power will devolve to Jason. He surely will not ruin everything, you know, I've worked for. Every, it's going to be smooth sailing from here on out. Things surely surely will not go in the toilet uh, just just eight months from now. Um, but that summer, what happened was the, the industry started to collapse. Ad rates started falling through the floor for reasons that I will explain in the boring part of the video that's, that's coming later. Um, and starting from like July on, it was just this nightmare of them coming back and saying, you've got to cut. You, we laid off like five full-time people. That was when Soren Bowie voluntarily left. He went to write for the show American Dad uh, on animated show on Fox. Um, still there as far as I know. If he's not been, been fired for some reason by now. Um, cut loose many, many, many freelancers. Slashed budgets. And every week it was just... You need to cut more. You need to cut more. You need to cut these bonus payments. Payments. You need to, you need to be paying less for the content. You focus on you know getting shorter content because we can pay less for that. Just cut, cut, cut. And also we need more traffic. You've got to bring back the traffic. So it's, it's somehow you need to 
to pay less money to the creative people making stuff and then somehow get more more work out of them. It's it was just this debt spiral where it's like we're gonna somehow cut our way to success and it was just I didn't sleep a full night that whole time because it's I'm going to these people because remember a lot of these freelancers, a lot of these contractors and 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 even the full time employees these were people I recruited. These were people that I talked into coming on board. These were people that I was out there in these public posts saying, hey, come right for Cracked. You know, the future is bright. And I put myself out there as kind of the face of, hey, come, you know, here's what we're doing. Come believe in our vision for what we're doing. And so then I'm having to come to these people and say, hey, I know you quit your job to be here because you believed in, in Cracked and in me and in our vision. Uh, we got to let you go. And I had to have that conversation over and over and over and over again to people and, and basically to people who uh, could not afford to lose the work. Um, and it was just a, this months long uh, death march. There's this obvious cut in the video right there as I decide, as I, as I, uh, decide whether or not to tell this anecdote, and I finally figured why not? Because again, uh, this video is going to be like two hours long, and, and again, it's who, who cares? It's so I, but I saved it for here because I know we've probably lost a lot of viewers already, and it's that's fine. To give you a sense of what it was like from my end, at, toward the very very end, like there, and I realized that this. This whole thing ends with me keeping my job. I'm not trying to present this like I had it worse than anyone. I'm just saying, here's what it was like because I'm the one making the video, and this is this is the situation through through my eyes. Um, our dog, a golden retriever named Ginger, in November, I think it was around Thanksgiving, we found out that the lump on her leg uh, was cancer. Uh, a lump that our vet for years had said was harmless. Turned out it was cancer and it should have been removed a long, a long time ago. So they removed it and then told us that it could be cured, but she had to have uh, radiation therapy or else it would come back. The problem with that was she would have to have, I think it was five treatments a week and the radiation had to be done at a facility that was three hours away from where I live. Again, I'm working from home at the time. This story will only make sense if you remember that I was working from home at the time. So um, the first appointment for the dog's radiation was to be Monday, December 17th. It's a day that lives in infamy among crack fans. Just keep that date in mind. This was the date they set it for. I took the day off took a vacation day, told them I got to drive all day, again, three-hour drive, six-hour round trip to get my dog repaired. I'm going to have to drop her off at the at the cancer, the dog cancer place. Um, I'm going to be on the road all day. The Friday before that, we get the mysterious meeting notice for an all-hands meeting, mandatory attendance, Monday, 10 a.m., December 17th. Everyone has to be in on it. So I sent an email saying, well, I, I, I'm, I'm off that day. I'm dr driving my dog to, uh, to the, you know, the, the, dog, the dog place, the dog uh, mechanic. Um, it's, can you tell me what it's about? Is something I'm calling from the road? Like, and no answer. Because remember, an all-hands meeting, that's not necessarily bad news. It could be something as simple as, you know, hey, we've announced some huge deal or, or they've reshuffled, you know, the front office. This person that was VP of operations is now CEO. But they would have a meeting because they want to tell everybody at the same time. But it didn't have to be something that even affected cracked, right? So I didn't know what it was. But when you ask what the meeting's about and you get dead silence, that's ominous. So we're all, the editors stuff, we're like texting each other. It's like, do you know what this is about? And there's speculation is flying. By this point, you know, there had been many cuts. They had had the, the board meeting where they had, you know, wrote down the entire purchase of the site. 
So we're like, well, have we been sold? You know, maybe somebody, which would be good news, you know, if, if another a company had bought us from Scripps, you know. But the point was we couldn't, there was no way to find out. So it, the dog's cancer appointment couldn't be skipped. But also I had to be on in, on, in on this call. And it wasn't the sort of thing where I could just do it from my car. It's I needed to be at home in front of my materials and, you know, in fully functioning as a person. So the cancer place opened at 6 a.m. I went to bed at midnight, slept for two hours, got up and at three in the morning, got in my car, drove my dog to the, the cancer place, left her there in this building full of strangers um, and sick dogs in a place that smells like terrified sick animals and had to leave her there got in my car drove back <laughs> a six hour round trip on two hours sleep mate got in my door just literally just in time to pick up the phone and, and call in for this this all hands call and hear them say uh we're shutting down the office we're, we're firing almost everyone but you uh, Jason are one of like seven people we're keeping to run the entire operation um, but everyone else all of your friends their lives are now in crisis everyone else is uh, they're all out of a job um, the brand that you have been building for the last 10 years has been obliterated and everything is in the toilet um, and then the rest of the day was this mad scramble of trying to talk to the people who had been let go, trying to understand what was happening, trying to console people, trying to coordinate with people, people scrambling to find out is there, you know, what's going to happen with their severance or their insurance. Meanwhile, they brought in a guy to run the site who was brand new to the thing. He'd just been handed to him from scripts. I'm having to meet with him, get on calls with him to explain everything about what we do and what the expenses are and putting together reports together like as fast as I can. Like, well, here's who's left. Here's how we make the content and then try to put together a plan on the fly for, we have millions of readers still out there. You know, um, we obviously can't make videos, but the, you know, we had, we no longer had an office. We no longer had a place where videos could be shot. We no longer had cameras. So, on two hours sleep, the point of this is that, and worried about my dog, I'm like going through, I worked until like three that next morning, I think, um, trying to put together a plan to keep it alive because there were still hundreds of freelancers and contractors and writers and creative people who depended on it. You know, this is, Crank was still a place where they could make a paycheck from their writing and the other outlets where they could go were dropping like flies. Cracked had suddenly become crucial to these people more so than ever. I still had friends who worked here. So now I've got this mission of trying to hold this thing together for them so that they can have, you know, a, a paycheck, that they can have a platform and that Crank, this thing that I had been building for the last decade of my life could continue to be a thing and that it, everything I had worked for and the whole reputation of it, that it wouldn't just disappear like a puff of smoke. So if we're going to get into whatever beef I have with how this was handled, obviously there's the emotional reaction of watching everything you've built be destroyed, but there's also trying to be from a rational point of view like well, what could have been done differently and I had mentioned before that that all-time traffic month that had happened a year earlier that it was across the website and then the YouTube channel and the podcast stuff traffic to the site to the text side had been edging down since I think like 2015 something like that but that was not a surprise this was why we were so aggressive about launching new shows in the podcast. This is why we were so aggressive about expanding video. And video was climbing fast. I think the last month before they shut everything down, the video streams had gone up like 30%, like, like November over October. 
by we had successfully grown those brands we had launched a bunch of you know individual shows that were all hits on the youtube channel we had a lot of you know good content on the podcast side that we were diversifying and doing what you have to do on a podcast where they're more and more specific because there are you know now there are podcasts that are all just it's a running podcast about one individual tv show or one individual murder case and it's a whole podcast just about that and so we were doing that. We, we were following these trends. And as traffic edged down to the text side, I, I thought that was okay because I thought that was the point. We had been told by everyone you talked to in the industry for years that all of the ad revenue um, and all of your, your chance to stay alive is in video and podcast for a really simple reason. They had, in the time that Cracked had been around, invented... The, the smartphone and then companies uh, had made unlimited data plans common. So the era of someone wanting a deep dive into some crazy civil war battle or some weird piece of trivia or scientific trivia, instead of reading a 2000 word article on the subject, they would now listen to a podcast on, on the subject or watch a YouTube video on the subject. Um, because those are things that now that you've got a device that can do it on the bus and you've got the data plan where you can stream an hour long podcast on the train or whatever, wherever, that's just people prefer passive entertainment. This is why TV is popular. This is why movies are more popular than books because you don't have to read it. You can sit back and just receive the information. And I'm fine with that. I mean, what do I care? As long as the content is smart and it's good, and it's accurate. Um, the, I don't care whether or not it's delivered in the form of text or in the form of, of audio or, or interpretive dance. I, I don't care as long as the core value of what we're doing and the content and the voice of it is still there, then that's fine. So I was fully behind um, that transition. It, it's just that when they ran into this this kind of rocky media environment, it's like, oh, we've got to cut, we've got to change what we're doing. I would have thought that you would say, oh, okay, the environment is going to force us to accelerate that transition to where you guys who are writing articles, people like me, you know, who don't do video because there's no real, I, I you know, I'm, I'm a thousand miles away from the office. I, I can't be in the studio um, even though, you know, now, obviously during the pandemic, you have all sorts of shows, uh, doing their show where everybody's just doing it from home, but you know what? They're terrible. They're all awful. So that, if anything proves that I could not have been part of the video crew, but I would have gone to people like me and say, look, the effort you're putting into doing, um, the text side stuff and the articles you need to refocus on doing video. Either you become a writer for the video side or help on the production side, and let's ramp that up. And if it means like launching multiple channels or whatever, let's double down on the part that's growing. Because at the time, all of like the media buzz and the positive coverage was all video stuff. It was all about the podcast stuff. It's when we would launch a new show. It was, you know, it was the video team. It was Cody Johnston. It was those guys, they were the ones that were getting stopped in the street by fans. Um, I wasn't getting stopped in the street by fans. Like, that's where the buzz was because that's where the industry was going. So if you're going to lay people off, like, lay me off. Don't, don't get rid of the people who are the public face of the site. You know, people loved Dan O'Brien. They they loved Soren. They they loved Cody. They loved. These are the faces where it would be like the way I've described it to people in meetings since then is that it would be like if one year the office just fired everybody, it fired Steve Carell and John Krasinski and and all of that, and replaced them with a bunch of actors you'd never seen before, but like tried to reassure people. It's like, well, it's still called The Office and we still have the same writers. It's like they don't care. that They want the faces they know and love. And Cranked had become this collection of faces and personalities. And just from a business point of view, I'm going to be real frank here. 
one reason, one struggle we had on the text side is that if you have a list of really interesting trivia, you can't copyright that trivia. Anyone can take the facts you, you put down about 10 fascinating things you've never known about the Star Wars franchise or whatever. They can take those same facts and just write their own list. And from a reader point of view, a list of interesting facts about Star Wars is kind of a, just, a, it's like a commodity. It's, it, it doesn't matter where you get it. It's all just the same product. You can get it anywhere. But there's only one Cody Johnston. There's only one Dan O'Brien. So when your content is based on a personality and a face and a voice, another site can't steal that. You know, only you have that guy. Only you have After Hours. Only you have these, you know, these shows. And it seems like the way through the woods is to take this thing that only you've got, which is, you know, these personalities and this process for creating content for them and keeping the core of that. And this is the thing that like your public reputation is based on. This is what the fans are passionate about. And then try to figure out some way to make money off of it. Uh, it through whether it's through sponsorship deals or by saying, "Hey, you know, if you uh, if you want to see Dan's show, uh, you got to pay a thousand dollars to watch it." And instead, they did what, in my view, was the most catastrophic thing possible, where you had all of these beloved characters that everyone knows going on Twitter and saying, "Hey, I've just been fired a week before Christmas." And my life is ruined. And all of these people swearing like, well, I will never go back to crack. Like, why would I want to give that company my, you know, my, my money or my traffic? Like after they did this to, you know, to, to Dan and Tom and David Bell and all these great talents that, I don't know. Um, and it's possible that my way wouldn't have worked. Um And I mentioned earlier, it's capitalism is a beautiful system in the sense that you can have something truly horrible happen and the blame for it gets split so many different ways that like nobody goes down for it. And I think they could say the same thing that, that as much as we also don't want to be short sighted, that we also would love to say, hey, Let's not worry about 2016. Let's try to build Cracked into a brand that's making us a ton of money in 2025 that the shareholders simply won't tolerate that or the board won't tolerate that, that ultimately everyone answers to somebody else and that there simply wasn't patience to, to see it through in any other way it's hard for me to understand that because in that case, I don't get why they bought it because if you are trying to make like a quick buck off something, buying a website is not how you do it. I thought they were buying Cracked for what it could be five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, because again, that was the whole thing with like, this is a company that has existed since 1870, whatever. They think long term. You know, they think in terms of uh, this could be an institution. This could be a name, a brand that means something, not just now. But after, you know, past the podcast era, after YouTube is no longer a thing, when we moved on to the next thing, it doesn't matter because what we have done is we have built a voice, a culture, a brand that is about ideas and about how they're presented, and that's bigger than any one medium. And so who cares if we have to spend the next year transitioning away from banner ads or away from, from this monetization model, who cares? We're thinking long-term. We're a 150-year-old company and we are here you know, to take what you do well, find the core of it, make it bigger, better, and make it into something that lasts. The fact that they pulled the plug so quickly, the truth is there's more to the story than what I know. And as soon as I say that, you're thinking, but is it something like really sexy? Was there like maybe some sort of sexy subterfuge or, or, or backbiting? 
I, I don't know how sexy it was or wasn't. Um, it felt at times like the guy or guys or whoever had made the decision to buy Cracked bought it and then immediately left the company. I don't know if that's true. It may be that it's something similar to that, but it felt very soon after we were on board like no one was there who understood why they made the purchase. It felt very quickly like whoever would have been going to bat for us wasn't or wasn't in a position to or they had bought it and it wasn't what they thought they were. Whatever it was, it felt like they soured on it very quickly for reasons that someone out there knows, um, but I, that, that person isn't me. Uh, so after like 55 minutes, it's time for another question. I hope that answered your question, um, whoever asked that. Uh, Tom C. asks, do you feel any lasting regret about some of the decisions you made or do you feel like you did the best you could in the circumstances? I, uh, out of all the 200 questions, this is what I intentionally put on here because this really is the dumbest part of the whole thing. If you gave me a time machine and sent me back to 2015 where I could pop out and say, hey, everybody, I'm from the future, Trump is president, there's a plague and no one can leave their house. Um, the, the, the US military says that UFOs are real and we just kind of ignored it because it's, we have other things to worry about. But also, you've all been fired and, uh, and the entire industry collapsed and we were caught up in it and kind of got it worse than most sites, but maybe not as bad as others. But I'm here to avert that catastrophe. I don't know what I would do different because you may not be able to tell, I'm not a business guy. Um, most of what I know from business is from watching the show Succession on HBO, where one of the plot points was like, as a show of dominance, the old man, Logan, urinated in the office of his son, uh, Kendall, to like prove that he was he like couldn't do anything about it. Um, and then his brother, I think at one point, masturbated on his window. It's a weird show. But most of what I know about business comes from watching that. And if you try applying the lessons you learn from succession to real life, it very rarely works the way you think it's going to. I have no background in business. I wasn't hired for that. I had a background as a guy who was working in a cubicle who had a very funny website and a very funny book. Um, and I was there to help them write and edit very funny articles. And But funny and, you know, it was stuff that was researched. I do have a journalism degree. It was stuff that was kind of fact-based and that's what they wanted. So I was brought in to do that. I was not brought in because they're like, hey, this is the guy who's going to make us rich. He's a, uh, he's, they call him uh, the man with the green thumb because everything he turns in, he, ta he touches turns green like in the famous legend of the 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 wizard with the green thumb i don't i got lost in the, the king midas that's who it is everything he touched turned green i think is the story but the point is that's not um that wasn't my background i i'm not a monetization guy i'm not a guy who can tell you how to make money off your website as a content guy so as things went along I was in a lot of those meetings. Like I, you know, it, one of the, I pushed very hard for like merchandise. The, the, remember we had, we sold the t-shirts, maybe they still do. Um, or we had like stolen some copyrighted character and, and made like a, a, a joke shirt out of it. I pushed really hard for that. I pushed really hard for the subscription stuff as long as it did not have a paywall, it wasn't hiding any content. I was the one who was saying, look, you know, no one in this room has ever clicked on a banner ad except by accident. Let's find other ways to make money, but all of the other sites that tried to do what I wanted to do, it didn't work out for them. They're, they're all, you know, College Humor had a massive merchandising operation. It didn't save them, 
They went to an all an all subscription model toward the end. It didn't save them. So none of my ideas on the money stuff. When I, I've seen our competitors try it, and and there they laid off everyone just like we did. So, you know that shows what I know. Um, and it could be that everything I'm saying about what we should have done, um, uh, that I'm just talking out of my ass because. Who, who has found a, a model that works other than the sites that are just so huge that they can publish 5,000 pieces a day and just carpet bomb social media with their content and just try to win on volume? Um, but we were never, that was never going to be us. We're, we were a small operation. Even, even at our height, I say we, you know, we employed like 43 people. Like I'm proud of that. But I think at one point BuzzFeed was like 800 uh, the Onion, I think, had 150. You know, we were always the smallest of, of all of the sites. We had a huge traffic footprint. And at one point, we're making a lot of money, but we were always very, you know, we were always kind of a small crew. So we always had to find a way to do what we were doing while only publishing like, you know, like 30 or 40 articles a week, a few things a day, basically. Um, and it's very possible that nothing, um, that none of, in my time travel scenario, that nothing I would try to work, even with the foreknowledge of what's coming. Because when I look around this environment, I'm not seeing other sites that have really succeeded. Who Who is succeeding are the brands that are just basically podcast only. Like Bill Simmons, is a sports commentator, very famous, but he has a, a site called The Ringer. And then it's a site and then a, a podcast network with a bunch of hosts that he's built out over time. He just sold it for $200 million, but do you know who he sold it to? To Spotify, an app that's audio only. In other words, they didn't want the ringer, the website with the articles. They wanted the suite of podcasts that he had built up because they had tremendous audience and you know brand sponsorship deals in place, and he had built that up. Um, so it, it it feels like if it worked for him, like that's where if we had, maybe if we had in 2015 said, we're going all in on podcast and video stuff, we're going to do 10 times what we're doing now, maybe it would be different. Um, but other, again, other brands that did that um, have have fallen in hard times just, just as much. Next question, this is from... Casey, um, what's the worst pushback or criticism you've ever received to any of your ideas or opinions from the podcaster columns? On the other hand, what's a recent example where someone's input or your own observation has changed your opinion about something? Um, you don't have to have done a lot of writing on the internet for a very large audience before you realize that the feedback you're getting is almost worthless. And I don't mean that there's not really good feedback in there. I mean, there's so much bad faith feedback that it is extremely difficult to discern what the valuable feedback is. Um, you get a lot of, when people, because again, content just triggers people's fight or flight response, you get a lot of people who only know how to react by demanding you be fired or demanding that you stop writing or because they they can't process like this person who's saying things I don't agree with, I have to make them disappear from the landscape somehow. They've got to go away. Like I can't deal with them being out there saying the thing I don't agree with. It's very strange um, because they can't just dismiss you and move on. They've got to stop and and like say, you must stop writing, you must be silenced. Like it's, this can't be allowed to continue. So obviously that you learn to tune out because I've been getting fired this person since 1999. That's when I started my first website in the late 90s, sometime 98, 97 around there. But I've been getting fired this man. You shouldn't be, someone needs to turn off this website. I've been getting that for 20 one years. So that gets old very quickly. Um, these days, 
whenever you have a, a, a group that is invested in some specific cause or whatever, they're very good at swarming and mobilizing and harassing anyone who says something they disagree with. If you've ever written an article that has mentioned like decoying cats, if you've ever written something that mentions circumcision, um, you'll find suddenly there's hundreds of people. It's like, where are all these circumcision guys coming from? Well, what happens is they've got Facebook groups or subreddits or some gathering place where their whole thing is, it's like, hey, we've got today's target. This guy is in favor of circumcising his infant. Attack. Swarm. So again, you've written a thing and you get a, this mass of hundreds of, of messages, you know, saying you should die. Well, do you, do you come away with that saying, well, maybe I'm wrong? Or do you say, oh no, this is like a human bot operation, basically. These people are literally copying and pasting the same slogan over and over again. So what am I supposed to take from that other than this is just a game to them? They're fighting a culture war and I'm just the target of the day. And you get that with a lot of subjects, including things you would not think would trigger that, that kind of backlash, as many people have found out when discussing Star Wars in the last few years, uh, or, or female Ghostbusters. There are things you didn't know were hot-button subjects, or that there was a, a, you know, a lobbyist group out there that, was, that had dedicated themselves to like stopping all discourse on the subject. So there's so much of that noise that if in there is someone who is being very thoughtful and actually wants to help you improve and wants to say, hey, is like there to say, hey, look, I can see the point you thought you were making, but you actually have this, this, and this wrong. It is extremely difficult to find that person because in order to find that message, you have to read hundreds and hundreds of death threats and people telling you to stop creating. So even if you're not traumatized by the death threats, the hundreds of people telling you to stop writing, to the, you know, that your work is making the world worse and you should be fired, that can kill your desire to create, which, you know, is not much better than the death threats. So if your goal is to have a career doing this and your goal is to keep doing it long term and to keep doing good work, I cannot in good conscience advise you to read your comments section or if you've got a public email inbox or your Twitter mentions, God forbid. Because what you're seeing is in no way a representation of what the audience overall thinks. What you're seeing is a distorted, in many cases, a distorted, very loud signal from people who are, have mastered the art of making themselves seem more popular, like that their point of view is more popular than what it actually is. Maybe the worst thing that can happen is you start to think, well, you know what, that this is the purpose I serve. Like I think there's literal New York Times columnists who are operating this way. It's like, hey, it's my job to make people mad. It's my job to have a, a bad opinion that's going to get everybody worked up because that's great traffic, that's great engagement. All those comments, that counts as engagement. You know, that's great for Facebook and social traffic because all of those comments and dislikes on, on or likes on Facebook and all that, that all counts as engagement. So I think that you can make you a worse writer where you're now responding to the haters by saying, well, you know, this is my, I got to give them a target. I got to give them something to yell about. This is my role in the world. That's like the saddest life I can imagine living as a creative person. So... If it sounds like I've eventually arrived at just, well, just don't listen to feedback at all, it's not that. It's a, as a creative person, the true feedback, you've got to find an outlet of people you trust, either friends, colleagues, you know, some people who have Patreons. They say the feedback you get from Patreon is great because those people are all paying. They're paying customers. You know, and so they're not there to try to make you stop creating. They're not there to try to drive you off the internet. They're there to support you. So when they say, you know, this last video, um, you know, like, I can see what you're trying to do, but I feel like the point got lost at the end. They mean that. They're trying to help you for the most part. Um, 
and there and I think if you want to have a career doing this, if you aspire to write or do whatever, that's crucial. Try to find some outlet of either filtering the the feedback you get to just the stuff that is actually valuable or get a group of people that will give you honest feedback, but that it's not just, you know, your best friend who's going to, you're going to be afraid to say anything's going to upset you. You know, it's got to be people to give you impartial feedback that is constructive, that know what they're talking about because they've got some experience or, or whatever. Um, I know that seems like I danced around that answer, but but I, that is the more important point. Is that it's actually really hard to get a sense of what, um, of what the valuable feedback is, and and what you should listen to, and what you shouldn't. It's one of the biggest challenges of our of our age, because even if you're not someone who does this professionally, if you're just posting on, I don't know, Twitter or or whatever. You can't judge by how people respond whether or not that was a good tweet because it could have been some big account could have just screenshotted it and then sent a bunch of, of rage your direction just for the hell of it. Mike asks, how do you feel about the quality of your writing while it cracked versus your solo career prior to that when back when I was running my own site? Do you find the format um, crack typically uses inhibits your creative process? I'm a weird person to ask by that because I actually came up with that cracked format. <laughs> they, the lists, if you don't like the cracked lists, that was one of the things I brought. They had started doing that um, when I got there, but I had been doing it on my own site and had seen the same thing they saw cracked, which is that traffic to a list article was much, much, much higher than if you had that same, the exact same ideas as just one giant block of text. If you break them up into a list, People are more willing to click because you're giving them a clear idea of what you're about to tell them. Here's exactly six um, inventors who got screwed out of their invention. uh, And you know what you're getting. It's not a trick. It's not a lie. It's not an exaggeration. There's six of them. They're inventors. They got screwed out of their invention. The stories are fascinating. We're going to run through them. We're going to spend like 400 words on each one. Um, and the, I, I found that that format for me, I loved it because it really helped me organize my thoughts. Um, because I'm not, you know, if you just let me ramble, I'll, I'll just ramble. But I know that's not, not what the readers want. So if there's some subject I find fascinating, if I've noticed something really weird about a movie series or or something that I feel like nobody else has ever really called out before. Um, I I love the idea of sitting down and kind of organizing it into five points because someone like me struggle with attention deficit issues, struggle with organizing my thoughts. Um, It's very nice to have this framework. I can just put it into one, two, three, four, five, and then kind of lead people through an idea. And I found that with that format, you can get as weird and as philosophical and as deep as you want. And the all the format does is it kind of gives people a package to present it in. But it, it didn't, I didn't feel like it limited me that much. And, you know, considering the type of work we were able to do, where you're able to do everything from a list of 12 things that don't make sense about the Batcave to an interview with Syrian refugees, um, which we did, and it sent, you know, Robert Evans went to Syria and talked to these people, or can interview um, people who left white nationalist movements. Being able to cover subject as serious, subjects as serious as we wanted, or as silly as we wanted, but just saying to the readers, look, the deal we're making with you is that we're going to present this in a very straightforward way, a very readable way. It's going to be kind of, it's going to be in this voice. It's very crude and funny and irreverent. um, And that's what's consistent. But within that, we may explore every subject in the world from cooking tips to the dumbest Silver Age comic books ever published to, you know, the worst horror monsters ever created for film. We're going to explore the whole world that what is unified on the site and what holds the site together is this voice, this format, this tone. 
I think that it let us do an incredible amount of really good work. I think that work hopefully continues today. The people that are still writing there, I, I hope what they're doing works. I hope it works forever. I hope that, uh, that five year, years from now, Cracked employs 100 people and that the success I had is just seen as a blip on the radar because they're so much bigger than what they... I, I hope that they look back and say, wow, that was really... You know, Jason leaving the site. That was like when uh, Carmelo Anthony left the, the Denver Nuggets and they actually got better after he left. I hope it's, I hope it's like that. Next question from Iman asks, as someone closely associated with the working of a major content site for so long, when did you first begin to observe a shift in the readership towards shorter content? And as a writer... Have you ever privately held onto a value judgment regarding that shift? Meaning, do you judge people for wanting shorter content? I'll answer the second part of that question first. No. If you're going to make content for people, whatever you're going to make, videos, write books, poetry, whatever, you have to meet people where they are. And the reality is, if I ever criticize people for not wanting long articles or anything in certain subjects, I would be a hypocrite because in my own consumption habits, when I'm not working and instead am just a consumer of media, by God, I'm telling you, I do not have a lot of attention span, you know, for anything. Like I, I, if I, if I've come to your, your recipe, I don't want to read six paragraphs about how this was your mother's recipe in the old country and then she died and you you cooked this stew to remember. I want to know how many potatoes I have to buy for this recipe. I'm at the grocery store. I'm reading the recipe because I, I need to know how many potatoes I need. That's me. So when I see other people, when I look at the traffic and look at their reader behavior and it's like, oh, they they weren't into this really long article I wrote. I can't sit there and be elitist about, well, the kids these days with their their Fortnite and their Twitch uh, and their white nationalism, they, they're not into the stuff that I like to make. It's, it's I, I'm going to spare you that. The first part of the question, as someone, to remind you, as someone closely associated with the working of a major content site for so long, when did you first observe a shift in the readership towards shorter content? The answer to this is the thing that I find absolutely fascinating that I'm, I say for the end of the video and we're like an hour and 20 minutes or something like that. I don't know. I'll edit some of this out probably. But either way, I saved it for now because I think some of you will find this very boring. Um, but uh, I just light up talking about it because I think this is really, really interesting. Even though this is the thing that ruined the lives of, of, of most of the people I know. This shift came when we went from people browsing the internet on a desktop PC, and I'm pointing at the desktop PC that you cannot, you cannot see from here, and shifted from that to browsing on a phone. You could observe as each month that went by, as the percentage of readership, because when we started in 2007, I think something like 15%. Only the nerdiest of nerds had a, an internet capable phone in 2007 and actually used it as like their way of browsing the internet. By the time I left in, in 2000, um, this year, whatever year this is, <laughs> Time has lost all meaning. By the time I left in current year of 2020, I think 80% of the browsing was done on our phone. So our audience went from being almost entirely desktop PC to being phone-based. And you could watch every month as more and more people were on a phone, the nature of what they read and the format of the content that they liked completely followed. People browse content in a totally different manner on a phone than they do on a computer. And if you're saying, well, duh, like it's a screen's much smaller, it's not that. There are psychological factors and there's the way your brain processes information that is different on a phone in ways I have never heard anyone talk about. 
but it is really important um, even if it is a bit dry, dry and, and technical. Back in the desktop PC days, people browse the internet in a certain way. Specifically, for the most part, they would have a collection of sites they would go to. And again, I'm pointing toward, toward my computer that you can't see. And they would bookmark these sites. And every day or every week or however frequently those sites updated, they would get on their computer and they would go through their bookmarks. And then, so if you were running a website, you were trying to build up a loyal audience of people that would bookmark, bookmark the site and come back every day on their own. And then when you had a piece that would truly go viral, it would go viral across a bunch of hundreds of different sites that were bit like aggregator sites um, from the olden days, like some of you, like, like FARC, um, something awful would, would like spotlight stuff on their front page. Um, there are a bunch of these. So it was like Metafilter, Gorilla Mask, Dig. Do you remember Dig? Um, slash dot. There were these portal sites that, that would kind of aggregate content. But for the most part, your audience were people who showed up every day on their own. And so they were kind of there on board with what you wrote. And they would kind of turn up to say, hey, let's see what this blog or this website has to say today. So you could, you had some freedom to play with the format um, to kind of have fun, you know, you could do a lot more like inside jokes, things like that, because it was more about the people who are there for you. Now, that atmosphere does exist, but it exists on YouTube, where you can go into the comments of some YouTube personalities' videos, and the comments are all these inside jokes and stuff like that, and the guy, the YouTuber, can can do a video that's just something completely off the wall because they don't care. The way YouTube works, it's going to, you know, their subscribers are going to show up and watch it. Um, the whole internet used to work like that. In the mobile era, that completely changed. For whatever reason, it is possible to bookmark a site on your phone. It turns out no one does it. If you have gone to a website in the last four or five years and you've gotten a bunch of prompts to download the app, it's like, hey, you enjoy reading, you know, The Verge or whatever on your browser. Wouldn't you like to have a completely separate piece of software you have to freaking launch every time? Well, the reason they're doing that is they're trying to get you to do the equivalent of bookmarking the site because nobody bookmarks sites on a phone. And so they figure if you have um, the if you have their app on your like your home screen. That's like your bookmark because it's like a visual reminder like, oh, The Verge, I'll tap on that and see what's going on on that site today. Um, it is incredibly difficult to get people to download an app. We've had one forever and the number of people who come in through the app is microscopic compared to the larger audience, which makes sense because it's a pain in the ass. Why you have to download a whole separate thing to read Cracked? Why you do that when you can just tap on the browser and read it that way? But it turns out people don't even want to tap on the browser. What people wanted was one thing they could tap on their phone that would give them all of their websites. And so for people who are under a certain age and who are male and gender, that is Reddit. They have one thing. They have an orange face on their phone. They tap that and everything they're going to browse on the internet is going to be there. For people who are a little bit older um, and, and women and people who otherwise um, would not be caught dead on Reddit, then it's the blue it's the blue F, Facebook. That's their internet button. So as mobile browsing became more and more popular, the number of sites that fed you traffic dropped and dropped and dropped. And all of these aggregators, all of these fun sites, you know, and that used to send you traffic, their influence in the amount of traffic they sent you just shrank and shrank and shrank and got smaller until it was just Reddit and Google and Facebook. Um, so Google, obviously, that's your search traffic. Um, and then Facebook, Facebook basically in 2011, 12, around the era, went to all of these sites and said, we are, we are your new platform for publishing. People want one destination they can come to, and that destination is Facebook. Facebook has two 
billion accounts, I think. So you want your audience, you need to be on Facebook, you need to be spending money to build up that follower account, you need to be dressing up your page, and then the deal is we get your traffic from the people coming to our site to see your updates, and then in return, we will provide a feed for your fans where instead of having to come to crack.com, they can come to Facebook, and then in their Facebook feed, they will see your updates in their feed. And then if they tap on just your account, they can go to your Facebook page and see all of your updates in order. And sure enough, we had built up, I think almost something like 4 million fans on Facebook. We, like all other websites, pivoted so that we were running entirely through Facebook. This fundamentally changed how readers behaved. Anything, the question was about like how short, like people are preferring short content. It's not that they prefer shorter content. It's that in this era, when they're browsing on Facebook or Reddit or on Google, where they're just seeing headlines, all that matters is urgency. How urgent is is this news? Now, Even if you're talking about a lighthearted subject, if you're doing something, you know, an article about uh, superheroes, before it cracked, where we're doing humor and kind of observational humor, we could do like a fun kind of roundabout thing where it's like, hey, let's imagine what, um, like what workplace posters would look like in the Star Wars universe. Like around the Death Star, what would their, you know, the, the posters, the, what would their safety posters look like? So you're pointing out, you're making observations about things that kind of don't make sense about the universe in kind of a clever visual way. And it's like, warning, there are no uh, handrails on our, any of our platforms. You might fall off. Um, if you did that same bit today in the mobile slash link aggregator era, it would get no traffic whatsoever. The version of it that would get traffic is 20 weird things about the Star Wars universe, where you take those observations and simply state them outright without any, even the, the slimmest veneer of creativity or, or any the cleverness, anything like that. You just state the plot holes. That's what I mean by urgency. The reader is saying, no, I need the point you're making delivered straight to me. And in the world of like headlines and titles, you, the stuff that people will click on when they're looking at hundreds and hundreds of links on Reddit or they're browsing their, through their Facebook feed, the thing's gonna make them stop scrolling and tap with their thumb is the thing that is either urgent, like, hey, here's five cooking myths that could kill you. Here's five fitness myths that can cost you money. It's it's like, it's urgent because this thing affects your health or this thing affects your income. And when you're writing about pop culture, it's things like, here's 20 plot holes you never noticed in, in Lord of the Rings or whatever. That has urgency too, because you're threatening to ruin Lord of the Rings for them, right? Because it, a plot hole is one of those things where once you've seen it, you can't unsee it. So all of the bias in the publishing industry went toward creating urgent headlines because people are no longer bookmarking your site just to come visit your site and seeing what you've published that day. They are browsing. Your site is now a series of a few links in an ocean of 10,000 links that they'll browse that morning on Reddit or wherever they go. And you're trying to make yours stand out in the crowd. That's why there was this epidemic of, you know, you won't believe what celebrity died this week. Or, you know, you won't believe what this person just said of the clickbait headlines where they're trying, they're leaving out a key piece of information, something we tried never to do. You know, the whole purpose of doing the list articles was that we're stating, here's what you're going to get. You're going to get five things you never knew about the Civil War or whatever the subject is. Now, we can't put those five things in the title, but we're saying 
You're going to get five things. They're going to be interesting. It's basically like, you know, it's like here's a pound of hamburger. We're telling you how much hamburger you're getting. There's no mystery to it. We're not trying to trick you. You're not going to get in here and find out that it's all a prank and that we're talking about instead of the Civil War, we're talking about the Marvel Civil War. It's exactly what we promised. It's good. It's high quality. It's The information is true. You know, that was supposed to be our business model. But you very quickly get overwhelmed with all of these other sites like Upworthy where they've developed a perfect like headline format that is simply more urgent. Uh, you know, here's the celebrity drama that you haven't heard about. And you know, you're not going to believe what, what this person said about this person or whatever. That really, really changed the way the way people processed kind of public discourse and the type of discourse that breaks through. And I'm going to give you an example that kind of is emblematic of where we are as a country, which is we wrote a lot of articles um, that were kind of exploring the morality of a movie. From our point of view, it's like this makes it more interesting. Uh, like it's interesting to think about Bruce Wayne is a billionaire. He could take his money and like try to fight the systemic problems in Gotham City and fix their, their failing educational and mental health system. But instead he spends his money on like a, a tank shaped like a, a bat that he individually chases these mentally ill people through alleys with. That's fun. Those articles were not trying to cancel Batman. And they were not trying to stir up outrage. The whole fun of that article is that it makes that franchise more interesting because there's these interesting moral implications of behind it. It's interesting that the original Star Wars trilogy has like two speaking parts for women. It's interesting. You don't notice it, or at least I didn't when I was a kid. And then once it's pointed out, or, or once it's pointed out that there are like no women in Lord of the Rings. It, it's it, The speaking part is like 95% male. That's kind of weird. It doesn't mean that you stop watching those movies. It doesn't mean those movies are bad. I, you know, it doesn't mean that they're even guilty of anything. It's interesting. It's interesting to point out things with, with the industry and choices, creative choices that are made. But the whole point is that it makes you smarter. It makes you a smarter media consumer. At least that was the idea. In the mobile kind of urgency outrage era of headlines, that has to come across now as we are canceling Batman. Batman is sexist and racist and you shouldn't watch it anymore. Because now... If you're trying to, to stand out on a list of links on Reddit or on Facebook or wherever, instead of saying, hey, let's have an interesting discussion about the morality of James Bond or about any of these franchises, because it's really interesting to talk about, what jumps out is James Bond is canceled. You are wrong to like that franchise. It's got to be this very simplistic black and white morality, and it has to be like this attack on the audience, like, we are going to kill the thing that you love. We're going to take it away from you. So this is a very long way to point out that the issue isn't length of content. I mean, people will listen to, you know, a, a, a podcast series that's 25 hours long. They'll watch a YouTube video that is a review of one movie that's five times longer than the movie, like the great Red Letter Media reviews of the Star Wars movies. Those are like 10 hours long. People will sit through that. But that's a different audience and a different mindset. That's people who are on a commute or they're at a doctor's office or they're, they're trying to kill time and they can put in earbuds and they can listen to some deep dive on some subject or other. But if they're browsing through their phone and they're doing that scrolling motion with their thumb, scrolling through headline after headline after headline, what they're looking for, whether they know it or not, is a headline that's going to light up this emotional like fight or flight response and it's going to be some headline that is an outrage or is threatening to them or threatens their values or insults their values or something like that. And that's the thing they're going to tap on. So in the world of text, 
um, especially there's such a bias toward that toward of like very you know lizard brain response to things that if you see a site you know like cracked at least cracked you know when it's at its best where people are still trying to do like deep dives that are balanced that are researched that are interesting and that are not just this very simplistic thing bad boy be loyal to that site buy their t-shirts <laughs> If they offer subscriptions, pay money, you know, do what you can because that's it's hard to survive now with the media environment we're in. It's hard if you're doing smart work, you're doing nuanced work, especially in the world of comedy, where the whole point of Cracked was that we weren't going to take the cheap shot, we weren't going to go with the obvious joke everyone else is making. The idea was supposed to be that this is stuff that is factual and it's researched, that it's also fun. And, you know, it's for smart people or people that like to be smarter than they were before and where you can read and feel like you've learned something. Right now, that's, that's hard to do in text format. Um, and that's why, you know, everything I said about feeling like the future was in video and podcast, there seems to be audiences there are so much more patient with that kind of thing. And, you know, I feel like I could have been happy transitioning to a thing where my job is just to write or research for somebody else's show. And I think that's probably where the future would have been if in some alternate universe where things didn't, you know, things didn't fall apart the way they did. Um, in the meantime, this video has been sponsored by uh, my own books because I'm writing books full time now. Uh, this month, the this science fiction series I wrote, the first book uh, is called Futuristic Violence in Fancy Suits, and the cover is a picture of a bunch of guns and a cat to give you an idea of the tone. This is $2.99 on ebook formats, Kindle, and I think other ebook formats for the month of May. I know that I'm not pointing at an ebook. You won't get this for $2.99 like the hardcover unless it's like at a garage sale or something. But the ebook format of this book um, is $2.99. Some of you are still on lockdown because of the plague. It's uh, the book, it's very good. This is actually the most well-reviewed. This is one awards of the books I've written. Um, but at the same time, if you liked the other books, if you like the John and Dave novels, uh, you'll also like this because I'm only capable of writing in one in one tone. In fact, the sequel to this book, this two ninety nine this month, is coming out this fall. It is called Zoe Punches the Future in the Dick. Now, a physical version of it doesn't exist yet because it's 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 not coming out till October. It is up for pre order, and the the cover is. That's actually the cover. I couldn't, when I printed it out, for some reason it was this size. It wasn't, it, but it would, it, this image would be the, like it would cover the whole thing. So I, I made this mock up of what it will look like when it exists. But again, it, the tone of the books is conveyed by the fact that it's called Zoe Punches the Future and the Dick. Um, you would not expect a book series with titles like that to have won awards, but here we are. Um, that's it. The next video I do, the next Q and A video will probably be even longer. I'm going to do one on the John dies at the end books. I'll do a separate one on this series. I don't know, later in the summer or something. Um, I'll do one, I think just on like writing techniques, stuff like that. Stuff that I know the average fans aren't as into, but I know other aspiring authors really get into that. Stuff about like plot structure and, and how you you can how I come up with ideas and, and that kind of thing that that those people will enjoy. In whatever other category, again, like I mentioned, I got a ton of questions. I got many. I think there's some that's just broad like life philosophy questions. Uh, if I get truly bored, I, I'll do that and um, we can be we can just be bored together. 
Uh, thanks for listening or to this. I assume none of you were actually watching it because the visual didn't. It was always just me sitting here. So if you just were listening to this with your earbuds, the video is now over. Um, and uh, thank you. Stay safe out there and for the duration of the, the plague. I hope you and your family, everyone you know, are doing well. Goodbye.